pleasure to be here and I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you in the next minutes. Um, I'll try to be really quick about some very minor new findings that we've had lately, um, which I do, however, think are very important. And basically, that's what I'm going to talk about, about the GI of human milk. We've already touched on that this morning. Some commercial formulas and then just a short excursion into local breads and some popular German breads. All of these measurements um, that I'm going to present to you have been performed at City University because this was all done in uh, cooperation with Jenny Bright Miller. Now, I'm from uh, the Donald study, which is the logo up here, and I think we are uh, favored to have uh, data from infants and small children, and I know that there are lots of other studies as well going on, intervention studies and other studies that have good dietary data too. And um, we so far have never been publishing anything <laughs> Um, before the age of 1.5 years because we could simply not estimate the dietary GI of infants and um, toddlers because of the uh, lacking availability of data, primarily, of course, on human milk because that's, of course, what in the first month you're mainly consuming. So what we did with Jenny um, was um, trying to get that value. And, of course, you cannot uh, have normal uh, subjects as in the ISO standards to have... Uh, human milk samples. So what we did was we recruited 10 healthy lactating mothers. They had to have their baby at least six weeks ago and have to have sufficient breast milk for the baby and the milk for the test. And they should be willing to consume their own breast milk. Some of the women thought that was really yucky and they didn't want to do it. But we did finally end up finding 10 uh, mothers who would be willing to do that. And they had to have slept well the night before the test sessions. They were asked to express this milk over two to three weeks and then um, to have fairly representative samples of the end of, and the beginning of the uh, feeding and they stored it at home <coughs> and then for each of the sample, lactose content was determined. And um, I was actually with Jenny in 2008 and 2009 and wanted to carry out that study. And I've put this on here with the approval of the human ethics because it took us eight months to get it through ethics. So by the time we had it, I had to leave. Um, but they were, uh, <laughs> luckily they went on and did it finally. Um, <clears throat> so that was a bit of a problem. The testing was of course done in random order. Um, the own breast mix, mix sample was one thing and we compared it to a popular common infant formula that we thought would be a good choice. So it's lactose based. And reference food was measured twice. And here are the macronutrient profiles from the breast milk and the infant formula, as you would expect. Of course, the human breast milk only has the oligosaccharides, and it's got the very often cited lower protein content. And um, as I already said, the carbohydrate here came from lactose. Okay. So this is what we found. Here you've got the reference food um, showing you the spike. And the two didn't really differ, and when you looked at the GI of breast milk and infant formula, of that infant formula, we did not see a significant difference. Now, we were also interested in the insulin response because there's data out there showing that insulin levels of breastfed um, infants may be lower than of formula-fed infants, and possibly that could be due to the human milk differing in the insulinemic response, and here you see there was no difference, and that's also seen by the data that we analyzed. So there was no significant difference between the two. So we concluded from that that human milk and a typical formula, they elicit similar postprandial glycemia and insulinemia, and that most likely in that whole programming effect discussion that at least uh, the postprandial glucose homeostasis effects that are elicited by breast milk and uh, formula that they cannot be have anything to do in that issue. Now, you all know that this whole breast milk debate is now more and more probably we're looking at confounding, and this is just another piece of evidence that's kind of supporting that view. Okay, so for us, it's also interesting that this value can now be used to estimate the dietary GI and II among infants. But to be able to do that, we also need to look at other infant formulas, and luckily, the group of Jenny Bremmuller could put some data into that publication as well. And this here up here, we may not be able to read really well, but um, this was our a comparison formula, which then again, when you do it properly with the normal 10 healthy volunteers, not lactating women, 
again gives you a low GI and a relatively low II response. But we also looked at other um, infant formulas, and there were some that were actually in the high range. They were inter interestingly, they had the carbohydrates coming from corn syrup solids and maltodextrin. So there are some others that are all also somewhere in the upper 50s. So when we look at that, we see that there's really a wide range of response to common formula, and we don't really know whether that may have a long-term health effect for when you choose to give your child a higher GI formula. So it would be interesting to be able to look at that in um, observational studies that do follow children up, be it either observational or interventional studies. But you would probably agree that this data is still not enough to really allow us to estimate dietary GI and especially II of the diet among infants. So that's my first gap. That's the title of my talk, to look at some gaps. So I think we do need, in addition to the um, human milk uh, GI, we need more data on commonly consumed formulas. And that may, in fact, vary from country to country. OK, now children, as they get older, they uh, do get complementary foods. And when you look at you know, the uh, database from Jenny Brian Miller, you can see that there's, again, very little data. That's what I uh, pulled out just very quickly. So this is only six values and um, <clears throat> no, five values. And I just noticed that there are some values uh, with rather high GI. So um, commonly consumed complementary food may have medium or high GI. And we really have very little menus and foods out there that have been tested. We know a bit more on the, I think it's called baby porridges or gruels. They seem to all have rather low GIs because they're prepared with whole milk. But again, there are only few data out there, and we need to have more, and we don't know if they're all low GI. Um, I had a very uh, quick look at uh, our data from the Donald study, and um, really, when we look at what are the main carbohydrate sources at the meal at age six months, it's commercial baby porridges and gruels. So that's what uh, makes up most of the carbohydrates in the meal. And of course, follow-on formulas are important. And these commercial baby porridges and gruels, at least in Germany, are still consumed in very large amounts at age 12 months and even come up as very important carbohydrate sources at our 18-month assessment. So I think we really need more data on that, too. So that would be gap number two. And then moving on to something completely different. That's perhaps a very German perspective that I have. But I, I grew up with, in, this, in my scientific career, with the thinking that German breads are so much better than other breads in the world, and that they all have a lower GI because um, they're produced in a traditional way, using a lot of sourdoughs, et cetera. So when you look in the tables, there are not really any German breads. And so we thought we ought to start somehow. So what we did was a, um, a PhD student of mine, she went to work with Jenny for um, six months, and they looked at um, some German breads. We could only look at four because we didn't have more money available. So this is a typical one that just barely made it as a low GI food. That's called Kraftkerne, and it's got this typical um, whole meal rye with intact grains and uh, kernels in there. And we also looked at the soft bread sauce that Barack Obama probably had to eat with his um, uh, beer the, the other day. And that's been becoming increasingly popular, and it's often served at nutritional meetings um, and in the breaks. <laughs> so that's a common uh, popular food, and it's got a tremendously high GI, as one would expect, but we didn't have the data, and so now we have it. And people in Germany will hate me for um, showing this. And um, then we looked at two other breads, because we often hear that organic food uh, breads are particularly popular and maybe better. So this is a wholemeal spelt wheat bread, and it made it into the medium category only. And another popular sourdough, rye, wheat bread, only medium category. So bottom line is really that what we think, that German star breads may be better than others, that's probably not true. Many of them may have a medium or high GI. We really need to do more local testing and perhaps even in Germany develop local GI alternatives. So um, that's for us. We've got to approximately 300 different types of bread, so there's work ahead. 
Um, I asked my colleagues who works in China in the north to send me some, because she's also doing um, assignment of foods to, uh, <coughs> of GI values to foods consumed in China. And she sent me a whole table of foods that she had no idea what to assign to because there were no similar um, alternatives that she could look at. And I just brought three foods along for you uh, where I really think we, we don't really know what we're talking about and it would be difficult to assign a value to that. So there are lots of other values that we need to um, <coughs> measure in other countries as well. And that's my summary. We now have data on human milk. We've got, I think, at least three gaps. Perhaps you've got other gaps that you want to discuss with me. And perhaps there are other gaps from consumer perspective because mine is very much an epidemiological perspective looking at what we don't have data for assignment for. Thank you. I was wondering, yeah, I'm your results, of these here your results on, on the formula, a formula for, um, there is a two preparation from way, yeah. from, of course, the way, which were the way and the casein out to the yeah. letters. And I could expect the contrary, so uh, higher <coughs> insulin in the one with 60% whey proteins compared to the one. Yeah, well, we, we only looked at the one in terms of, G oh, oh you, you meant the... the I, I mean, yes. That's true. Well, we, what we generally observe that we, uh, I, I was much more variable than the GI, and yeah, yeah. we're not really sure we, whether we shouldn't be increasing the N number for that outcome, but mm -hmm. you're right. It, it would probably well, be, it's such yeah. a mistake, because yeah. of, of the story on we, the, well, it's, 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 of course, an interaction of what type of carbohydrate do you use, and then what's well, the kind of um, yeah. 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 ratio, that's right. So I don't think we can really extrapolate on that few okay. data. Awesome.